Listen to shoot the defense. It's unbelievable, Jeff. Welcome to Shoot the Defence, brought to you by the FNX Network, My Sportswear, and the Offside Trust. I'm your host, Stel, and on this edition of Shoot the Defence, I had the absolute pleasure of interviewing former Sheffield United central defender and current head of recruitment for Everton's under-23s, Jamie Hoyland. Now, before you guys listen to this one, I'd just like to say, this has probably been the most interesting and enjoyable interview I've done in a long, long time. Mark my words... You will love this show. Hello, Jamie. All right. Yeah, good night yourself. Yeah, great. Thank you. Brilliant. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Look, I really appreciate you uh, agreeing to come on the show. You know, I know it's uh, it's quite late at night, so I no, don't... I don't be silly. But thank you very much for asking me. Pleasure to do it. No, no problem at all. Great, great, fantastic, fantastic. How are you doing anyway? Everything all right? Yeah, good. Yeah, believe it or not, it's. Uh... Everybody said, oh, you'll be having a rest now. It's the busiest time. <laughs> so all the stuff you tried, you've been trying to do and get get your targets, you're trying to get them sorted now. So wow. it's, uh, yeah, a, bit, a busy time at the moment without watching much football, really. Wait, I'll tell you what, you must be uh, watching that under-20 World Cup, though, no? Well, believe it or not, Paul Simpson's my best mate. We oh, started wow. off together at Man City. We were He was 15, I was 16. We got put in digs together. And we, we probably, well, I've learned from him at Preston, but we probably speak to each other every day. I spoke to him straight after the match. Yeah, so wow. uh, I'm absolutely delighted for him. And obviously with a lot of Everton lads in the squad as well, uh, it's brilliant. Yeah, really good. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's been an intriguing tournament so far, isn't it? Because, I mean, they they beat Italy with ease today, didn't they? Yeah. I know they went yeah. behind early, but... It, it just yeah. Wasn't... I, yeah, I mean, I watched the one, uh, was it the other day, when it was a bit like... Oh, uh, who did you play last round? I'm trying to think now. Oh, it's, it's, it's and, it was, and it was, uh, you know, and then they played today. And, I mean, they could have been four up beginning of the second half. They just pinned them back and they played superb. He made the right change, brought on Ojo, who got some pace going as an impact sub, and, and away they went. So, no, I was really pleased with them today. Yeah. I, thought they were, I thought they were superb. Yeah, really good. Yeah, it should be a good game because Venezuela aren't no pushovers, are they? No, no, fuller athletes and got one or two individual players, so that will be interesting, yeah, but if anybody thinks that's a gimme, uh, I don't think it is, because they've done brilliant to get to the World Cup final, so, no, it's going to be a tough match for that, but I'm really good that they've got a team in a World Cup final, which is brilliant, yeah, yeah exactly. great stuff. Exactly, because you know, you always see these old, you know, where are they now kind of thing, and, you know, 10 years yeah, from there, yeah. yeah. So it's nice yeah, it's brilliant to look at them. I've been looking at them a few this week where the last lot got to the semi finals. I think it was 90, 93 or 94, and you think, I played against some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Just shows you how old you are. <laughs> some went on to have great careers, and some actually frittered away out of the game, which is amazing, really. Yeah, yeah, it's scary how that happens. I mean, I, speaking to some former pros myself and seeing what they're doing now, a lot of them can't even get into coaching in the UK. It's, it's, no, it's shocking. No. It really is. Uh, oh, it's sad. It's, it is sad now. I mean, I coach for, I was lucky enough to coach about 17 years after I came out of it. Um, but then I'm fi- it, I found it very, very hard. Uh, different mentality. <laughs> Not so many ex-players in it, and a lot of lads, very young lads, getting involved in it, who never had any experience, never had any call face stuff. I'm not saying about playing, but even experience of coaching, and we're, we're taking over. But if you look at the England setup now, there's a lot of ex-pros st- uh, running the teams. There's a lot of lads there with not as much experience, but they're starting to get quite a few of the old pros backing around it. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing, actually, because end of day, you've got to realise what goes on for three points on a Saturday and stuff like that, and, and, and play to win. Yeah. And I think Paul mentioned that a few times today about the winning mentality. You know, it's all right having all this philosophy and what we do, um, but it's about winning, and that's, right. and that's what they've done, and they've done it great. That's right, that's right, and good luck to them, good luck to them. So hopefully it won't, um, it won't go to their heads, they're still young. Well, that's the big thing. I must 
touched on it. That's that's a massive thing, um, which we try and do at Everton. We have Dave Unser, obviously, with the under twenty threes, and Unzi, you know, he's, he, he works them hard. They all love him. He's got fantastic respect off the lads, but they have to work hard. And off the field as well, they have to, you know, apply themselves right around the training ground when they're eating, when they're doing everything. It's a bit of pride in yourself, and they never anybody. It's, it's a funny, it's a funny old club for that because it's a massive club, big club, but there's nobody with any egos whatsoever. Mm. And that, I think that comes from a lot of the staff. They don't let anybody get away with anything, and I think that's what has to happen. Some young lads get a lot of stuff now. At a young age, and they think they've made it, and their agents are telling them this and that. And actually, they, they just need the coaches just to keep them in line. And, and they haven't done everything yet, um, and they need a few like role models around the place to do that. Tom Davis at our place is a perfect example. He could be on a million pounds a week; it wouldn't bother Tom. Mm. He, he just loves playing football, um, and, and he's a great example for young players at our place. Brilliant, fantastic. Right, so, so Jamie, whilst doing my research. I came across a few really good did you know, so to speak. You kind of think that you'd, you'd hear in a pub quiz. Um, <laughs> the, the first one, which I'm sure many Sheffield United fans are already aware of, is your, your father, Tommy, played for the club for 12 years. Now, another interesting fact is John Beresford's dad actually took you and John to, to Man City as he was scouting there at the time. Now, I know Sheffield United is actually in your DNA, so is there any particular reason you didn't start your career there instead of Man City? Well, that's a fantastic bit of research as well. Um, yeah, there is. Um, the reason I didn't at the time is because my dad um, was a bit... Well, he still is a legend. He's one of the oldest players still alive now. In fact, he's 85 next week, my dad. And it was, I was always going to be uh, son of Tommy. And I was never going to be my own person. There were People at that time would have still compared me against my dad. So... I've been to Man City a few times with John's dad, you're right, and John himself, uh, and it was a fantastic club. And so we just decided as a family, it would be probably best to, 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 to start away from there, from Sheffield, from the on-time club, grow up a little bit, get away, and, and get cracking with it. As it is, when I even came back at 24, the first thing what people put on my pen bit in the programme was Son of Tommy. Wow. So I never went away anyhow, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, that was the reason. That was the reason I, I, I did it to try and have a, a start away from, you know, always being in my dad's shadow. I suppose mm. that's understandable. That's understandable. I mean, the thing yeah. is, you actually made your professional debut at seventeen, and you played a big part in the eighty four, eighty five promotion side. Now, unfortunately, you had an injury riddle three years at City and was released aged twenty. Now, did you think that was it for your career? Um, no, I mean, the, the, the funny thing is, I. I yeah, that's all. That all that's correct, and I, I, I actually didn't know I was going to get released. And I went to see Billy McNeil uh, with my new terms. I mean, I was on eighty pounds a week then. I'd, I'd signed wow. Bruno at seventeen. It was twenty. Uh, yeah, eighty pounds a week at Man City mm. as a pro. <laughs> and I went in wanting hundred pounds a week. And I went into his office. I remember it's plain as anything now. I'm fifty one now. I remember going into the Main Road at the top top office, not his office, sitting down and I was just about to say, Billy this is, and he went, you're released we're releasing you, I've yeah. signed three more players oh. and, it, and to be fair it, it knocked me, I could have knocked me over with a feather and he went thank you very much but I'm signing Mark Lillis Nigel Johnson and I can't remember I can't remember who the other one was and I went, right, and he went, so I don't need you, and that was it, I was off at Bless City and obviously for a, for a little bit you're a bit raw but then in my own psyche, I thought, right, I'm going to prove you wrong. I, I need to get back and show him that I can, show not him, but show people that, yeah, I can be a, a good footballer and play at a decent level. That's right. And uh, ironically, you got a trial with Norwich under Man City legend Mick Summerby. Uh, yes. What, what's, the, yeah. what's the club's geographical location the only reason you chose them over Berry? Yeah, it was actually. Uh, yeah. yeah. I went to Norwich on trial um, and it was a... a Beautiful club, uh, great people, great area. In fact, I'm going there on my holidays next week, North Excellent. Norfolk, I love <laughs> it. But I just thought, wow, and I'd met, actually I'd met a girl who I finished up marrying the time I asked you this, and I thought, this is going to be a long way, four, <laughs> four five hours. Uh, and suddenly Barry came in, round the corner, and I thought, no, I'm going to try and build my career there. Fantastic. So, I think it was Martin Dobson, didn't he play at central midfield? 
Yeah, well, I went there, Martin rung me, um, I said, will you come and sign? Yeah, I signed, and he said, right, where you go, and I finished up playing, no, I went as a centre forward, uh, and a centre half, and, and just into me, a little bit at Berry, Dobbo went to me, right, I'm going to make you a central midfield player, I can see you in me, hmm. and, uh, uh, sorry, myself, in, in you, and I'd never, ever, I was 21 then, ever played midfield in my life, he said you'd be fine <laughs> and obviously for the first few matches wow what was I doing and I got into it because I played centre out so I could get back and defend but I started my career as a centre forward right? and, and I was never going to be a centre forward because I had no pace <laughs> but I could get into the box and time the runs and I weren't a bad finisher and it was brilliant I used to get out wide ball go out wide I'd make the runs into the box and I scored a few goals from midfield and I loved playing in midfield yeah it was great Brilliant, brilliant. So, what would you say if I said the, the name Sammy McElroy? Oh, wow. I'd say, I mean, what a man to play with. He came to Berry and we were all in awe. We had quite a lot of young lads. And Sammy walked in the dressing room and we thought, oh my gosh, he's, come, he's been at Man United, he's going to be. And he was the best person ever. He, were, he was if, as he, he was coming on trial, Sammy Mack. Wow. But what a player to play with. He would just give Sam the ball and he knew he'd keep it and give it in a better position. And he did more for young players at that club. Andy Earl, David Lee, Phil Parkinson, Liam Robinson, myself, who went on and, and I suppose did all right in the game. Mm-hmm. But playing with Sammy helped so much. He was, uh, he was brilliant. Brilliant as a person, brilliant as a footballer and brilliant to, to help you and, and encourage you give you confidence all the time and I must admit he, he was a great great um, influence on my career as as Bob Martin Dobson see this is the interesting thing because a lot of time, when you hear a, uh, you know, a top-level professional like an Ibrahimovic signing for Manchester United 36 years old people think oh you know he's only going there for the money but a lot of people don't think outside the box and, and realise that yeah. he's been signed because you've got youngsters there. So when you see someone like Sammy McElroy, as you said, stepping into the dressing yeah. room, you must, guys must have obviously been in awe of him. What did he give to you guys off the pitch? How did he help you guys grow as, as men? It just, um, just how we talked about the game and how not, and, and kept everything really simple, you know. And actually... It was about hard work. Sammy was probably one of the fittest people still at 36, 37. Wow. And so you thought, well, if he's fit as that then, and by the way, Sammy loved a drink. Right. <laughs> so he taught us a bit of that as well. <laughs> but but he, he, drunk, he did that at the right times. Mm. When he trained, he trained as if he was playing an FA Cup final yeah. every day. He wanted to win everything he did. And just those things rubbed off on players who wanted to be footballers, really. Mm. I mean, I suppose, you've mentioned in the room, Richard Man U, another one when I was playing is Eric Cantona. When he came to Man United, right. he reckoned he was unbelievable. Last one in, uh, last one off the training field, first one on it. And, and the kids like Gates, Beckham, all like that, just got things off him. And so, I know it's only Barry, but, but Sammy was a massive part in a lot of us, as, as some older players are when they go to clubs. They've had fantastic careers, but what they do is, is lift everybody else and, and you use them as your role model, I suppose. Mm. The thing is, nowadays we think, ah, oh, 36 years old, he's still old, but he can, he can still play. But back then, those pitches were heavy. Oh, <laughs> well, well pre-season used to be running around Eaton Park in Manchester <laughs> and, you know, the long runs and all like that. And Sammy used to be up there. He used to be in the top three every time. Wow. So all that, and then, you know... You, there were a lot of games then, and there were no squad rotation then, yep. because you had to play to get your appearance money. Was it and one Sammy sub? Pl- was it one sub back then? Yeah, one sub. Yeah, yeah. and and yeah, one sub. I, mean, I forgot <laughs> about that. Yeah, and and Sam, but Sammy wanted to play every single game, and and made sure he did. Never missed anything. Never shirked anything. So yeah, and like you said, the pitches were not the best, but he, he played loads and loads of games for Berry, mm-hmm. and you just think, wow, what what a pro, what a pro! Brilliant, fantastic. Well, earlier you mentioned David Lee and Liam Robinson. I hear you formed a, a great relationship on the pitch with them. Are there any particular games you feel the three of you really clicked? Uh, yeah, probably. The, I mean, the, there was one where 
Um, we went on a great uh, run in what's the League Cup now? I think I don't know, is it Capital Cup? I can't remember even what it was. Yes, it might be Liverpool's Cup. Mm-hmm. Cup. It was Liverpool, and we we played QPR at Gig Lane, um, uh, and they were actually top of the first division, which is now the Premier League. They had an unbelievable side: Paul Parker, David Seaman, uh, Fenwick, Les Ferdinand, loads of really, really good players. And that night we were superb. Um, and Liam scored the winning goal, and, and it was just fantastic. How, how you know, David, you could you, he'd make a great, he'd make a really bad ball into a good one because of his pace. And Liam had was a great finisher, so you could lay, you could smack a ball down the line for David and look good, and lay one through for Liam, and he looked good, and he scored the winner that night. And, and that, I think, at that beating them that night, I think it, it, it gave a, quite a few of us in the team thinking actually we're not bad. You know, we, we, we've got a chance here with our careers if we can keep keep our heads and, and, and keep our standards and keep going, really. So, yeah, we all helped each other in, in that. We were, we were quite a youngish side, all similar ages, and uh, I think we pushed each other a little bit all mm. the way. Mm. Brilliant. Well, the big bad wolf, Wolverhampton Wanderers, they made an approach, and you met Graham Turner at Molyneux to discuss a move. Can you tell us about that experience? Because as far as I understand, there's a bit of a twist in the tale which involves a ripped bar mat and Dave Bassett. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fantastic information, yeah. You have to be listening to my after dinners. Now, uh, no, Spice what, everywhere. What happened, that, what happened with that is um, I had no agents then, no agents at all, um, no mobile phones or anything, and I wrote letters to every club. I'd had four years at Berry, wanted to move, and Wolves were dead keen. They came out of nowhere, wanted to pay 250000 for me in 1990. And so they said, can you meet me at Great Bar Services? Um, Graham Turner and uh, Ron Duke, who was, who was the late Ron Duke, who was the big chief scout there, and said, will you come down and meet us? So I said, yeah, no problem. I'll come down and meet you. So, like I said, no agents, naive Nick here from Sheffield who went down. <laughs> And we talked and, you know, I wanted to come to Wolves, we're, we're doing this. And I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. This is what I want to do. And he said to me, yeah, what are you looking for? And I said, and I honestly, I've not got a clue. I've not even gone with figures of money. I just wanted to better myself. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll write this down. And he, he ripped the bar, man, bar mat off for me. And he said, right, this is what I wanted off. And he wrote these figures down and he pushed it back across to me. And like I say, naively, I picked it up and went, wow, that's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd offer me 650, 750 and 850 with a signing on fee for each year. Wow. And it was like, I mean, that then uh, more or less trebled my wages what I was on for the first year. And it was just unbelievable. I'm thinking, well, anyhow, I said to him, listen, I'm going to ring Sam Ellis back at Berry because I said I would do when, when, when we talked, just to see if everything was all right. So I rung Sam, went, got me 10p out of my pocket, went into the pay phone, <laughs> rung up. So when the beeps went, got Sam Ellis on the phone and he said to me, uh, why has it gone? I said, yeah, brilliant. He went, well, another club's rung for you. And he said, I said, who? And he went, Dave Bassett, Chef United. I went, right, I'm on my way. <laughs> and I put the phone down, went in to see Graham and said, uh, listen, thank you very much. I need time to think about it. Uh, I'm off and he went right we'll ring you tonight I said yeah ring me tonight I got in my car and drove straight to Sheffield United uh, went in said to Harry uh, yeah he said right what are you looking for so now I'd learned (laughs) so I put £100 on each of my figures um, same signing on fee because I didn't bother about that Harry went uh, five minutes he went in to see Dave Kappa the secretary came back and went right we'll agree with that and I'd signed I'd signed within five minutes of going in. And to be fair, Chef United could have offered me 250 quid a week and, and I would have signed. It didn't matter because I was going home to play for Chef United who just got into which was the first division, which obviously is now was the Premier League and it was just like unbelievable. And for about three weeks, I was the highest ever signing 250,000 pounds, which was, which was brilliant. But I was, I was back home on a journey for four years. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> and, and to think, yeah. you know, and to think at the beginning, you're like, oh, you know, that's not the place I really want to start my career. But you're talking about the early stage of your career now, that you're, you're, you're mid twenties, and yeah. uh, oh, that's, that's that's a fantastic story. When I when I read it, I was like, I've got to ask this. I've got to ask this yeah. because the, the listeners oh, no, are going to love true. it. Yeah, it's all true. Five minutes. 
five minutes it took to, to sign it. And the thing is, after it, Wolves rang me. I was going away on a holiday the day after um, to Hong Kong. Actually, my wife, my wife then was a day student, so we got to Hong Kong and Dubai. And Wolves rang me all through the holiday, offering me more and more money, wow. thousands. And I could have made a lot. And I said no. And he made me ill in the end. He spoiled me all because I'd signed for Sheffield United. And I'd, I'd so disappointed. I'd, sorry, I didn't want to disappoint all, but I'd made my mind up and I'd, I'd signed it. The Sheffield United, that was it, and they were offering and offering and offering. And like I said, they, they could have kept offering for whatever. I was going to go back to me, my team were supported all my life, back in the top flight, and it was like, I suppose, like your, your um, dream come true, your boy old thing, really, what you read about. But it was happening to me, and I couldn't wait it to start. Your wife must really love you for you to turn for you to turn down that amount of money. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that's it. it. Didn't matter. Money, money was well. When I say it's not, it's never been really my driving thing. Uh, yeah, I'd love to, to now. It's brilliant into it with all the money, but yeah. I was playing football, and, and that was the main thing, the, the highest thing I could do. Of course, and you, you know, you, you reach your dreams. Do you know what I mean? So. And also, also at that time, that that wasn't bad money because I knew what people were. You know, other oh. people. And I, and I weren't doing a job. I was doing what I love doing. So I'm getting paid decent money for it. So, you know, I, I was the luckiest person alive, to be honest. Mm. And put this way, you, you went from playing the likes of Aldershot to making your debut for the <laughs> club you supported as a kid against, like, Liverpool. We had the, yes. you know, Ian Rush, John Barnes. I mean, that, that dream come true is an understatement. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Uh, I, I, and the funny thing is, we played Sheffield Wednesday in the Steel City Cup the week... Uh, the week before, and I clashed shins with Colton Palmer, and it was killing me. But I only picked the team, and I, I couldn't not say I weren't playing. But I got this unbelievable lump on my on my shin. Didn't say anything, and we played against Liverpool, which was like, wow! I'm mm. playing against Liverpool, like you say, those names. Red hot. Um, I mean, we lost 3-1. There were no sub-goalkeepers and Simon Tracy bro broke his jaw after 15 minutes. John Pemberton went in goal. <laughs> and it was just, just, just amazing. You know, it was, uh, what, what a game and, and all the atmosphere. But I got done for the drugs test after to, to do the drugs test. So like you say, season before I'm playing against all the shot Newport all these places next thing I'm in this room trying to have a tiddle next to John Barnes <laughs> Ian Rush and I can't remember which and I'm like wow this is this is just unbelievable yeah. but, but as it is my, my shin uh, blew up then and uh, it got poisonous we played the next game and it got poisonous yeah. and they had to rush me into hospital to, to actually take an abscess out but I was that desperate to play I didn't tell anybody and it put me back a, a couple of a couple of months actually at Sheffield United with that. But I was that desperate to make my debut and play that I got poisonous uh, shin, and I've still got the hole in it now from where they dug it out. But to be fair, it were all worth it just to play, make my debut for Sheffield United against Liverpool. That that sounds pretty serious. Could you have lost your leg? Yeah, I could actually. Oh. <laughs> they rushed me off against Derby at half time, and the doc there just rushed, they rushed me straight to hospital to get it cut out. Yeah. Oh, blimey. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Easy, eh? well, look, what, yeah. what, what was it like playing for Harry Bassett? Because I see a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of Harry, uh, a lot of him in Harry Redknapp kind of thing. Was he that kind of manager, that motivation? Yeah, yeah. To be fair, um, the thing with Harry was he was. I know this is going to sound because a lot of people said we played like dog and dog. We played it long and all like that. He was a man so much above his time. It was untrue. We had video analysis. We, we had the um, fitness guys in then. We had the diets. Everything was unbelievable what we did. I mean, they're going about Wenger bringing stuff in. Harry did loads of stuff on the Italians and what they did. And to be fair, he gained us points as the season went on because we were that fit. We did our weights. We did that. We knew technically we weren't as good as the teams at the top. Of course we weren't. But on the other side, it was but. He also had this thing about team spirit, and it was one for all, uh, all for one, one for all, and you really all together, and you do anything for your teammate, and it was unbelievable, and he loved it, and off the field, he didn't mind what he got up to, well, I mean, to an extent, you, but your team spirit was there, loved the lads having a drink and everything, but as soon as you walked into the football club ready to train, that was it, that was your job, and he was as professional as anybody. 
to be fair, I, I would have thought, like you say about Harry Redknapp, you know, I've never played for Harry, I know people have. Not the best coach in the world, but man manager mm. and get the best out of the players, fantastic. And that's what Harry Bassett was, was like. And uh, yeah, I'd be fallouts with him through the four years, but you do with every every manager you do. But I had four fantastic years playing for him, and I'd learned a lot actually uh, for my coaching for, for how he was and what he did, um, and how, how he was with people and, and how he how he prepared things. Brilliant, fantastic. Well, tell us about the ninety two ninety three season cup run because I, I assume you must have a lot of good memories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that that. That was uh, that was a fantastic one uh, with the cup run and everything. Yeah, I mean that that was. I'd just come back from a cruise ship. I'd, ma- I'd managed to get that. Brian Dean had just come back from. Um, I think he had glandular fever, Dino, yeah. and we came back at the same time, just as the cup, t- cup run got going. And uh, we we had a you know that was brilliant playing Burnley twice, uh, getting through the third round by the skin of his teeth, uh, just. Being Hartley Pool, and then we had Man United, which was which, which was a fantastic game. Blackpool in the quarterfinals, uh, Blackburn in the quarterfinals on penalties. One which and which I never watched a penalty. I just faced the cop and went on their reaction, and obviously, unfortunately, losing to Wednesday in the semi-final. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a great season, a great season for us all. Yeah, well, you scored against United, didn't you? And that that must be a, a big thing scoring against Hitch Michael. <laughs> well, I can tell my son now that I did, it was handball. Um, <laughs> I mean, I should I should have scored with the initial ball in from Glyn Hodges, which was a great ball. But when you see this the massive Dane flying out at you, I, I did happen to take my eye off it a little bit. <laughs> and uh, the ball ricocheted up and with my momentum, it did it before arm and, and went in. But uh, my son always says that it was handball. And I said to him, no, it wasn't, it wasn't. But I can tell him now, yeah, it was handball. <laughs> There you go. He still, he still says in the records books, to two one gigs, one for them, Hodges and Hoyland for Sheffield United. So yeah, uh, yeah, it was a, that was a fantastic day at Bramall Lane, brilliant, and, and live on the BBC as well, which uh, yep. got you a little bit of recognition at the time as well. So yep. yeah, brilliant. I remember that, and I seem to remember a, a certain bet Alan Cork made about his beard. Yes, well that's right. I mean Cork. Corky was brilliant with his beard because he'd scored against Hartlepool in the fourth round and he just started this beard and he said, right, I'm going to grow my beard until we get knocked out. So we all came in the day after waiting for the cup draw and uh, it came out and Sheffield United at home to Man United and you just heard Corky go, yes, brilliant. And we go, yes, brilliant. He went, no, no, I'll be able to get rid of my beard then because we'll not beat them. <laughs> and as it is, we beat him. And then, unfortunately for Corky, we had Blackburn, and we, that went to a replay. So he had another few times with it. And then the semi-final got moved to Wembley in front of a, a live audience. So he's at Wembley, seventy-five people, seventy-five thousand there, looking like all for the time and scoring as well. So right. serves him right for uh, wanting us to go out against Man United. But after, I remember him in the big bath at Wembley. I mean, we were all devastated losing, and Cork is there shaving his beard off and saying, "Thank God for that; he can come off now." <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fantastic! Absolutely yeah. fantastic. Well, Jamie, fast forward twelve months, and it was an emotional end to the season as the Blades were relegated at Stamford Bridge. What, what do well, you remember about that day? Uh, I remember being sub, uh, warming up with my brother-in-law at the time. Alan, well, his brother-in-law now, Alan Kelly. And we were finding out all the um, all the results from people at the touchline and people saying to us, "You're all right, don't worry, don't worry." Every you know, all the teams were losing, Everton were losing, Blackburn had scored in every match at home all season. They're playing Ipswich, it were nil nil. They were going to score, not a problem. Everything were going right for us. We were winning, and then suddenly, you know, it, it was one all. I got on, um, and at the last kick of the game. Um, I think it was Glenn Dennis Wise crossed it I think Glenn Oddle actually headed one on flicked one on and Mark Steen scored at the last at the far post mm. and at that time we thought well alright we've lost but all the other results will, will be, be no problem and we're coming off the pitch and my brother all came up to me Alan Kelly and just went we're down I said we can't be down we cannot be down we can't be down he said we're down we're down he said, all the results have gone against us. 
and we got in the dressing room at, the, at Stamford Bridge and it, it filtered through that we were and it was just unbelievable the feeling I oh dear of me and go on we couldn't get out of Stamford Bridge they were playing in the cup final the week after uh, or a couple of weeks against Man U and they were all there and I remember Eric Cole the agent just going round and saying to some of our lads who were based on oh, it's monster 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 they're terrible monster monster terrible I would just wanted to bunch him and say there's monster monster for you <laughs> and a lot of the lads did come back with us because they were Southern Bay so mm. we called the coach probably the quietest coach ever going back to Sheffield and as we pulled in the car park at Bramall Lane there was hundreds of Sheffield United fans and I thought oh we're going to get lynched here we we're going to get lynched and as we got off the coach, they started singing and draping scarves round us and hugging us, wow. and they were crying and we were crying. I've still got one of the scarves, actually, still. Wow. Uh, what, what a fan gave me that day, and it was just the most horrible feeling ever. Because uh, I was one of them, I was a fan, and I was devastated as anybody. Hmm. And whatever could have gone wrong that day went wrong, and sometimes the gods of football play it that way, and, and unfortunately... He knocked Sheffield United for years and years and years that going yeah. out of the Premier League that, that day. That's and right. it took him a long time to get back. So, uh, and never really c- recovered that much from it. So, yeah, sad day, sad day. But as they say, that's football sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Jamie, aside from that cup run, what were your favourite moments at the club? Um, favourite moments? So probably off the field. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing him, my dad had a pub then, quarter of a mile from Bramall Lane as well. Wow. So 
uh, it was just just brilliant at that time. Yeah, great, fantastic, fantastic. Well, your next club was uh, Burnley, I believe, and I think you played under Chris Waddle there. Did did that feel a little strange, given he's a Wednesday legend? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, Chris was strange. He came in <laughs> and he didn't really enamour himself to the senior players. He wanted us all out. Um, and I mean, he'll put his hand up now. Chris, Chris, what a player! Absolutely fantastic player. One of the best I've ever played against. Uh, but as a manager, it, it wasn't for him. It wasn't for him, and it never worked. It wasn't the club for him as well. Burnley, you have to be a special sort of manager to come there. And he, we survived the last match of the season. We beat Plymouth at home two one to stay up. So. You know, for Chris, it, it wasn't it wasn't good. Yeah, I didn't get on with him very well at all, um, and he knows that. But we're friends again now. <laughs> he, if I lived near my brother now in Sheffield, and my brother still gives him stick about it, but and I do want to see him. But uh, I've done some media work, and I've bumped into when he's doing Radio Five, and we have a good chat and everything. So, but I think he knew after a year football, football manager, not not for Chris at all. He's quite a shy person, to be fair. And, and speaking in front of groups and do, doing stuff. And to come when you've played for Marseille and Wednesday and Tottenham, to come down to Burnley, who were then in Division 1 with not the best calibre of players, some, some lads, it was difficult for him. Uh, when, he's, when he's describing runs that Papan had done at Marseille to lads playing in First Division, it, it never really clicked. <laughs> well, um, yeah. after Burnley came an eventful spell at Scarborough, and I say eventful because I know you feel it was a big mistake going there. What, what was that about? Well, I was actually going to sign for Shrewsbury Town. Jake King had said, "Come down and play for me," you know. And Jake had been after me for a little bit when I was at Burnley. He knew my ex-manager at Burnley, Jimmy Mullen, really well, and, and I, I was on my way there to sign, and. Uh, Mick Wadsworth rung me and said, oh, come to Scarborough, we'll give you two years and you can be player coach. And I'd always wanted to do the coaching and I thought, yeah, brilliant, that, that's right for me. So I went up to Scarborough, um, went in as player coach and never did a day's coaching in my life. It was all Mick and, oh. and it was just a nightmare of a club. We didn't get paid our wages for months on time. Uh, I'd come from four fantastic clubs, City, Mary, Burnley, Sheffield United, where everything was done right. And here, it was just an absolute nightmare. And they weren't paying you wages, they weren't doing all sorts, and they were shipping players out right, left and centre, and it was just the biggest mistake I'd ever made in my life. And unfortunately, again, we went down the last match of the season, uh, there when Jimmy Glass scored for Carlisle and kept them up. Um, but it, unfortunately for me, at 33, it made my mind up then. I'd, I'd have fallen out a love of playing football because uh, I, I didn't enjoy playing for me and I didn't enjoy the environment of, you know, some clubs where things weren't done properly. And I just, I just thought, right, time to make a break now. I'm not, I'm not. Once I didn't enjoy training and I didn't enjoy taking part in that, that was for me to finish. Right. Um, and, and Scarborough just did it for me. And I thought, right, time, time to do something new now. Yeah. And, that, and, and, that, and I look back on it now, probably at 33, I should have gone on, I should have I should have played on. Um, but they'd actually, they'd actually not be passion out of football, which I never thought I'd lose. But mm. uh, a few people had said, once you lose your passion for it, that's it. You've lost a bit of percentage. Don't go on league. I had a lot of uh, offers to go on league. And I knew I wouldn't be able to give it 100%. Yeah. And I'd be getting good money. But actually, frauding people. And I didn't want to do that. So it was time to come away from it. Mm. And then you, you actually entered the what I like to call the weird and wacky world of, of management. I know you became Paul Simpson's assistant at Rochdale because you coached yep. on the side for a bit. Yep. And then you yep. went to caretaker manager with David Unsworth at Preston. W- was it difficult? Like, a, Was it a difficult transition to make from, from player to management? Uh, no, not really. Um, because even when I played, because I didn't have much pace and I played set, I coached. I told people what to do. Right. <laughs> um, and I think because I played for Harry at Sheffield United, I'd always been captain at places and PFA rep. So uh, I liked getting a group of players together. Um, and, and, you know, having that bond and, and, you know, pulling a team together. So the coaching side and the manage- and the little bit of managing, it was not a problem. 
I enjoyed that. I enjoyed working with people's characters and the, the football ability. I always used to say that's, that you've all got that. You, that's not a problem. Or else you'll be footballers. It's the other side of it. Mm. And I enjoyed that with, with players. And, uh, you know, there's, there's ways of getting respect from your coaching side. And, and I think I, I got I got that, I think, as as I did with the coaching. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. And you coached at Sheffield United's under-18s for a year. Is that right? I did. Um, well, six months. Because six months. I went... I went back and that was that finished me co- that was the worst mistake coaching wise I ever did because I went back to Sheffield United thinking he's going to be the club it was um, as a player and he wasn't uh, it had changed so much uh, there was a conflict between the first team and the academy um, I got on with the first team Mason, Chris Morgan Billy Dearden uh, fantastic people Frank Barlow Darren Ward, goalkeeper, really good people, but the academy resented them, didn't get on with them, and I couldn't I understand that. There was uh, not many people who played football in the academy. They were all what I'd call uh, community coaches, school graduates, college graduates, and didn't understand what actually the main team is, the first team. They're the ones who keep everybody in a job. Uh, and from day one, from two weeks in, I could have resigned then, but as it was six months into it, mm. I was travelling over on the snake pass every day, and I thought, no, that was another one. I don't. I then joined me coaching for about fourteen years, and I loved me coaching, but I didn't like the political side of it, and yeah. decided time, time to move on again. Yeah, yeah. which is uh, which, as we said at the top of the show, a lot of people are doing at the moment now. So, yeah, uh, as far as I'm aware, you became a football summariser for the BBC Radio, for the BBC Radio Lancashire, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. I'd, I'd, um, I'd got into the football summarising and, and really enjoyed it. I, watching football, talking about it, having an opinion, probably because I'm a Yorkshireman. I think that <laughs> helps. Um, and not only, I mean, obviously I covered Burnley, I played for, but Preston, Blackburn, I mean, the seven teams for Radio Lancashire, and I really, really enjoyed it. And from that, um, they asked me if I'd like to do my own radio show. And so I said, well, what do you mean, your own radio show? They, and, you know, if anybody ever says to me, how are you, Jane? I always say, marvellous. Because I always think, yeah, I am. I'm marvellous. I'm alive. I love my <laughs> job. And, the, and so they called it Jamie Hoyland's Marvellous Special. Excellent. And so I said, well, who do you want me to interview? Footballers. went, no, no. Footballers, anybody. And I finished up interviewing uh, Jim Bowen from Pulse Eye, right. Steve Norman, the Spandau Ballet saxophone, saxophone player, um, a military policeman, journalists, um, an HTV driver who went around you, uh, all these people. <laughs> and my, my own gambit, I didn't have a script, he said, so what's the most marvellous thing you've ever done in your life? <laughs> and away you went, and that was it. And it was just brilliant. And I did, I think, 38 shows, um, and I, I did that every week as well as me summarising and me scouting for England and, and it was brilliant and then oh, not fortunate for the listeners probably fortunate for the listeners I got a full time job and I couldn't do it anymore <laughs> well <laughs> I know you're the head of recruitment for Everton's under 23s who if I'm not res- mistaken they won the league last season now forgive me for my naivety but are you involved in transfers for young players what, what does the job actually entail yeah I mean it's, it's amazing I, I, I mean to Man City and you know you had your, you had your uh, first team reserves youth team and they'd all mingle in and everything be together now there's an academy which has their own bit there's the first team and then under 23s so obviously the first team buy the players ready to go into the first team but now there's like a, um, an area where you're looking at players to come into that 23s I'm looking at players probably between 17 and 20 years to come into Dave Unsworth's squad to, listen, they might take them six months, it might take them two years, or to progress for the next stage to get into the to Ronald's squad and into the first team. So uh, that, I'm, I'm looking for potential who can, not to play in our 23s, but to play in Everton's first team eventually. Right. I go to under tw- other under-23 matches, other under-18s, first-team games. So it's... it's like your own little football club right okay he's, 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 um, he's a buy the academy wants to do that they recruit from the locals and, and everything but the under 23s 
because of the age I'm looking at, they they could be at clubs already or playing okay. in Europe. Okay. So you, it, it's it's usually entails a transfer fee, like Dominic right. Lewin, Dominic Calvert Lewin, uh, cost us initially four hundred fifty thousand down payment from Sheffield United last September. So it, it's looking at the talent what's up and coming to, to get into the football club. Right, okay, fantastic, okay, yeah. brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, oh, it's a fantastic job, it's brilliant. And I've got to say, I mean, um, you know, it's at centres down <laughs> at Sheffield United as a football <laughs> club, and Dave Unsworth, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with, with Unsworth, he sent Sheffield United down when he played for Wigan as well. That's right, yeah, that's but, right. Uh, <laughs> now we've got a bit of history being on the back, but it's fantastic. <laughs> football club is just a, uh, I mean, they do call it the people's club, and I can understand why they do that now, because... Wow, how it is around the around it is around Liverpool and the community projects they do. But like I said, it goes back. There's no egos. It's a real family club and a real one where everybody wants everybody to do well at the football club. Mm. Um, and and it has that feeling when you in, when you go there and you won't, you, you can't wait to go into the building and, and see people and get working. Uh, even though a lot of the time I'm out uh, at matches and, and doing stuff, mm. but. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real, real positive place to work. Brilliant, brilliant, fantastic. Well, Jamie, I've been told the likes of Kieran Dow, uh, Basala Sambu, Liam Walsh and Harry Charles are ones to look out for. Who would you say are the standout players, or is that a little unfair to say? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they are all good players. I mean, um, you know, they, they did terrific last season to win the league. They, they should have no chance of winning it, you know, with, with your cities, your Chelsea's, but... There's a little bit of teamwork in there. I mean, there is one uh, who's playing the World Cup at the moment um, who was under the radar a little bit, and that's jo- who was captain of 23, John Joe Kenny, a right back. And I mean, I've been watching John Joe play out in Korea where the humidity must be unbelievable, and he never stops up and down the right hand side, and he loves defending as well. Uh, and so hopefully, John Joe will be around it as well. Which, uh, I mean, obviously, he's had a bowler. Who we took from Charlton, who's you know coming into his own now, and, and Don Lewin, who's, who's broke into it, and Tom Davis, who were all integral parts early on in the season under 23s. And I must admit, with Ronald, if you if you if you're good enough, you're old enough, mm. and you don't mind giving him a chance, which is a brilliant thing and a, a brilliant tool for me to work when I'm looking to you know bring players and say come and look at what you can have at Everton if you do it you've got a chance of playing because mm. he, will, he wants good young players Is there a criteria then because I, I, I assume you know height size uh, technical um, ability pace all no, that No not really no mm. um, it's funny because when I used to go for Preston people used to say to me what, what you're looking for as a player you know you were big strong it must be I said a footballer right. I said what, what do you mean to a footballer I said, uh, you know, and obviously that was a different level at Preston, and I was, that's all I was looking for, and then I tried to mould them in. At Everton, they've got to come as a footballer. They, they, you know, to be at a Premier League club, that's a gimme. They've got to be really good footballers. Then the rest of it, yeah, there's pace in the game. Um, the high thing, I mean, we've got Liam Walsh in our midfield, uh, who's an unbelievable little midfield player. What a tenacious one is, and if you look at him, you think no chance. He's like a scolzy mm. size of him and everything. So it, a lot of it, as well, his attitude. You know, the, when you look at a player, it's that attitude he's got to his teammates, to himself, to the whole game. Because, like I say, a gimme is that he should be able to play football. That's you won't be looking at him; he can't play. But his whole attitude and way he is, because if he's got that attitude, that's going to take him a long way as well. Uh, and that's one of the major criteria that I certainly look at, and I know the lads look at as well. Because mm-hmm. he has to come into a special environment, especially working with Unzi, because he does half back and work hard. Uh, but he, he pushes them for the right reasons, because he wants them all to be Everton first team players, and you, you've got to have the right right makeup to do that. And uh, he tries to get every ounce of them for, to do that. Mm. Fantastic. What about approaching these players then? Because I know a certain club across the road from you guys got in a little yeah. bit of a, tr- a little bit of trouble. Um, what, what's what's the method of, of approaching these players? Well, it's, it's um, I mean, it's, it's the one where I mean we are good. Robert Elston, our chief executive, got Steve Walsh as head of football, 
uh, really good people. And, you know, we do our due diligence, we find out about them, we, we watch them, and then when we can, we'll look at the approach of the club. And, and so if we want to buy somebody, uh, um, an official thing goes in from the club, the club solicitor will check it all out, and it goes in, and that's what we'd like to pay for them. Um, and then if, if the clubs agree, then you can start talking to the players. But um, obviously, like you say, it's, it's very tight now. And, and you know, like you say, the club not too far away mm-hmm. from us has you know, had a bit of a nightmare this week. But, you know, uh, we, we try and do it through the, through the front door the right way and try and get the players through that. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, all the due diligence, due diligence goes off before it on, on checking the players and making sure they're up to scratch. And then try and try and do it that way. So what a, a solicitor just passes a, a letter to the club or a fax or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, an email uh, through Robert, uh, chief exec, probably the chief executive, whatever club you're going for, right. or director of football, and say, you know, we'd like to make this offer for this club uh, for this player, um, and then the club will say yes or or no or no, he's not available. He's mm. not up for selling. And mm. That's it, really. So. Yeah. Which you can understand. I yeah. mean, we're, we're after the best young players in the country and <coughs> clubs who have them don't want to sell them, which mm. I, I fully understand, really, yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, I remember the, the David De Gea saga last season with with a fax machine breaking down. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. 2016, yeah, right. 17. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, that's not really done. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, well, I don't need to do. I don't need fax. I don't know what they do now. I don't need, that's been delayed by having emails now. What you can do, yeah. but so, they all have to be signed. You see, everything has to be signed. So yeah, yeah, that's probably why it went through fax. Great stuff. Well, on a final note, I want to take you back five years to the time when you cycled near enough a thousand miles from Land's End to yeah. Donald Groats to raise money for Gary Parkinson, who I believe is a former player who's suffering from lock-in syndrome. Now, that's a gruelling task, but a rewarding, a rewarding one as well. What did you make of the whole experience? Right, well, that's, I mean, like I said, I played the party and I had the phone call that he'd, he'd collapsed and he got locked in syndrome. And I said to a lot of us because he was youth coach at Blackpool, I was at Preston then, and you know, it's one of those things. What can you do? And I, I just wanted to raise, wanted to raise some money. I, I knew him personally, and I thought I'm not swimming the channel. I can't do that. No chance. I, I'd run a marathon in 2005 because I wanted to do that before I was 40, before my knees actually packed in. Mm-hmm. So I'd done that. I didn't know what else, and I thought, right, a bike. And I'd never really been. I never. Well, I didn't even own a bike, and I thought, oh, I want to do Lanza to John and Girls. That's the one. I'll do that. And I put it out there uh, to a few people, and the next thing I got phone calls from a lot of people at Burnley Football Club who had done them before, on the, not the players, but people who worked behind the scenes, I'd call Chris Gibson there, and said, right, I'll set it up, I'll do all the logistics, we'll do it in nine days. I went, nine days? He went, yeah, well, that's over 100 mile a day, we'll get cracking with it. And uh, it was the most, uh, it was the best ever to do it with 10 lads, the worst weather all week, um, but it was just brilliant. It was just, because we all knew what we were doing it for, um, and, you know, to, to cycle that amount at the time, 100, 100 miles a day at least, and then get to John O'Groats and cycle in. And on one particular day, we got sent back uh, near uh, Dumbarton, on the side of Glasgow, we couldn't do it. We had headwinds and everybody were packing in. Bunches. and so that day we only did 80 mile and the, the minibus packed us up packed us in uh, all in took us to the hotel and when I got to the hotel I said I can't do this I said tomorrow morning I want you to the to, uh, the, 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 to, uh, the minibus driver I said I want you to take me back where we finished and I'm going to do 140 miles tomorrow because wow. I want to do it and wow. two of the other lads said I'll do it with you and I finished up they said right you're Capitano now you've took over it <laughs> and so when we got to I did it and it was brilliant we, that, that day was lovely weather and we went I remember cycling through Glasgow about 6 o'clock in the morning and it was beautiful and got up to dump, uh, finished it up at uh, Spay and it was just brilliant we'd done it and um, I, I knew then I could do anything because I'd, I'd done 140 when we got to Janet Groves we stopped just as we were going in and they said to me right you lead us in. Your idea, you captain. And I must admit, I, I rode into Johnny Groves uh, with a little bit, I must have got a bit of gritty behind, 
Because mm. <laughs> a, a little tear came down because what we were doing it for. And it was just like the, the old football days again where we'd all pull together and pull through it. And I think we raised about 25 grand on, on the cycle. That's and amazing. it was a, a fantastic thing to do. And, you know, such a sad thing with Gary. And um, he's still in the same same situation. Um, and we, we, we see him every now and again. And, you know, um, it's just one of those things, a footballer, a 44 ex footballer gets that. And for the grace of God, it could be any of us. And, you know, it, it was a great thing to do to raise it for him more than anything for us. So, yeah, I, I, I think what I'm, I'm very proud of doing it and so glad I did. It's fantastic. Now, the thing is, they're still taking donations anyway. So if anyone wants to donate, there's the uh, the Gary Parkinson Trust Fund. It's garyparky.co.uk forward slash donate. Yes, yeah, they are. And we st- they still do dinners and they still do all sorts of stuff for him to, to keep it going. So, yeah. Uh, I think the PFA have been very good with him as well. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, Gary was a very, very good footballer. Unfortunately, didn't play, you know, when the money was, when it was right up there, but that, that's it. And sometimes everybody just has to club together and, 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 you know, help, help, help people out when, mm. when it becomes like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Jamie, thank you ever so much for your time, mate. I, I, I really cannot thank you enough. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really enjoy talking to you about your career. Um, you're on Twitter, aren't you? I am, yes, yes. At Hoyland JB, yes. Brilliant, fantastic. Well, Jamie, again, thank you very much for your time, mate. No, Great. it's been absolutely brilliant. I'm so, I hope I haven't bored you too no, much. No, not at all. That, but it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed that. Actually, it's so that stuff, what you, what you found out about me, they're the first questions ever in my life I've been asked about them so <laughs> they are brilliant that's fantastic research thank you very much thank you very much well Jamie no. look the door's always open if you fancy coming back on the show we do review shows every week so you're more than welcome to come back oh I'd love to yeah that'd be brilliant thank you very much great Jamie thank you ever so much for your time mate. you have a good evening and I'll speak to you soon thank you very Keep much in touch. Cheers. cheers mate all the best thank cheers. you bye-bye. cheers bye 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 well guys that was Jamie Hoyland I knew you'd like it but yeah, it was an absolute pleasure having Jamie on. He's a fantastic gent, really knows his stuff. And I look forward to having him back on the show. Now, before we go, I'd just like to say a quick thanks to our partners. The FNX Network, at FNX Network. You follow them on Twitter. Also, My Sportswear. Give them a follow at My Sportswear one Tune into Sofa Sports News. They're another great football show hosted by Harry and the Lads. They're available on SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes and YouTube. Uh, Nick Tanner Events, The Offside Trust, Lucky 7 Management, Inspire Me Creations. And don't forget the Football Weekly Show, which is being launched on Sky Channel 23 on the 4th of September. We'll be there, and I hope you guys tune in. Until next time, take care.